It is that timely, so we're rolling with it. How are you doing today? I am great. It is uh, just an absolutely gorgeous day here in San Clemente. I'm excited to do the show with you and kick off this new project, Dewey. So we're going to be talking about our takeaways from all of these many years as players, as parents, in my case, as a coach, and sharing them with people for whatever they choose to use them for at this point in time. Um, and I've been doing this for, I was just thinking about it recently, and it has pretty much been three decades as a coach. And during that period of time, I had three kids that went through it at some level, um, and couple of them didn't make it all the way through. Actually, I guess the third one's just about done, too. Um, I know that you've been a parent and wanting good information yep. as part of how you got started doing Parenting Aces. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your journeys looked like? Yeah, I mean, it's been a rocky road for sure. I grew up playing tennis in Louisiana and quit when I was in high school, just kind of had enough at that point. And didn't come back to the sport until my kids started playing. And really my youngest child, who's now 23, ooh, um, wow. he was the one that really got the bug and took it seriously. And once he got into it, I started playing again socially and playing league tennis in the Atlanta area. But my son really, you know, really developed and went through the whole journey from juniors playing for his high school team. They won the state championship his senior year of high school, which was a great way to finish his junior career. And then he went on to play college tennis for two years at two different division one schools. So I am very familiar with college recruiting. I'm also very familiar, unfortunately, with having to transfer and the implications of that. And then after his second year, my son decided he was done. He really just wanted to be a regular old college student. And he has not touched a racket in about two years. And I will say I was heartbroken at the beginning, but I have gotten over it. I totally understand why he decided to leave the sport and have very high hopes that he'll be back at it as an adult once he kind of gets settled in his now big boy life, as I like to call it. He's got his first real job and, you know, working hard and trying to figure out budgets and, you know, being on a strict time schedule and all of that. So, um, yeah, so I've, I've done this from the player angle and the parent angle, not the coaching angle, but have certainly had my share of interactions with my share of coaches, both junior coaches and college coaches. So I think we bring a great perspective and balance each other out, do we, in terms of our experiences in the sport? Yeah, mine's been going on a long time. It's interesting. A couple of things have happened um, within the last week, and one of them actually not till tomorrow, that really has me thinking about what my journey has looked like. Um, tomorrow, I have a young man, he's still a young man to me, but coming to town as the coach of a player in the Boys 16 National Level 2 event that's being held here in Austin. And the coach was one of the first four students that I had when I got into coaching. So it was he and his two older brothers and one other person in their backyard um, and me working with them as a family. And now he's coaching top national level kids, I believe. You know, he coached somebody who came in, I believe, fifth at Kalamazoo. And so he's now a great coach who started as a player. Um, and when we talked on this kind of my show before this became our show last week, you were going and to a challenger event there in California. Yeah. Um, and it just so happens that someone who was in my program in Charlotte, North Carolina, won the event. Um, so he was, you know, a very sure did. He was a great junior player, he won the Little Mo three times, twice as the Little Mo, and then he won the first international Little Mo. Um, and then three Pete champion in the team thing at the University of Virginia, and then he won the men's singles yeah. um, his senior year, and now he's off playing pro tennis, and I believe his ranking went to a career high of 181 in the world based on his winning the challenger last week, um, which I think is a great And he's in the running to, he's in the running to get into Indian Wells now. 
Yeah, I believe he's second. There's two spots um, yeah. to get into yeah. the Indian Wells event based on how well you do in the Challenger Series. And he leapfrogged all the way to number two in that series. Yep. He beat Stevie Johnson and some other very good players um, along the way to the championship. So um, I'm always excited for him. I've been a fan since I gave him a sportsmanship award at six years old because um, he came and he was crying and saying, that because he lost a ten and under backdraw match and he was crying saying, I'm never going to make it now. Nobody's ever going <laughs> to sign me to a contract. And, and I just thought he was the cutest little thing. Um, <laughs> I said, if I ever have the chance to be there when he makes it, uh, I wanted to be there. And at nine years old, his dad called one day and asked if I would become his full-time coach. And so that was a, a coaching change for him and for them as a family. Um, and then uh, I guess about four years later, I moved from Charlotte, North Carolina to the Dallas, Texas area be for some personal reasons um, and not mm -hmm. anything to do with not wanting to coach him um, or another little girl who was three weeks older who had just beaten or just lost to Madison Keys in the finals of girls 12 play courts. Um, so they were like the two little kids that were just starting to be big kids. and I the girl I had coached from ball one. And they both were then forced to find new coaches at that point in time. Um, and I know from mm -hmm. talking to Ray Ray, who was the girl, she said that Ty at the time felt betrayed, um, that Ty had said to her, um, you know, he left us. And that's a hard thing. Changing coaches and change in general for some people is very hard. And at that point in time, once you've developed that level of trust, um, it be can become very hard. Um, so I think the, sh the show today is about what? Oh, I think, do we still have Lisa's audio? Lisa, are you still there? I'm here. Ah, well, today's, the, today's about the big switcheroo, right? So yeah. what, happens, what yeah. happens when you switch coaches? And... As a parent, did you ever have that situation where you were forced to or chose to switch coaches for your kid? Absolutely. My son, when he first started playing tennis, was it was through a little group in our neighborhood. We were living in Atlanta, and those who are familiar with Atlanta know that swim tennis communities are very common, especially in the suburbs. And that's where a lot of the league tennis kind of originates is through these neighborhood teams and these neighborhood courts. And so my son was asked to join a, a, just a local little neighborhood team. I think he was six years old at the time and he was playing on a 12 and under team. And the coach of the team was fantastic at, you know, keeping these kids interested, getting them excited about the sport, making practices fun and all of that. And then about three years in, my son decided he really wanted to start playing ten tennis tournaments, not just league tennis. And so I went to the coach and I said, you know, he's interested in tournament play. What do we need to do? I, I haven't done this in a million years since I was in juniors. And the coach said, you know what, Lisa, I am not familiar with the tournament structure. That's not what I do you should really find him a coach who specializes in high performance junior development and who understands how the tournament structure works and how to help him progress to meet his goals. And so it was, that was the first change for my son. And like Ty, my son did not handle it well. He loved his coach, it was Coach Billy, and he loved Coach Billy and did not want to make a move and put up a huge fight, even though I found a coach nearby. I remember taking him for an evaluation that first day and he was kicking and screaming, getting into the car, did not want to go, did not want to leave Coach Billy. And I said, look, you're the one who wants to play tournaments. Coach Billy has told you that he doesn't know how to help you do that. We need to find you a coach that can help. And so, so let's just go try this out. So everybody was on board but your son. Coach Billy's like, this is the best thing yep. for the player yep. because I don't understand what he wants to do next. So let's put him in a good place for him. You as the parent yep. who's kind of the captain of the ship at that point in time says yeah. in order for him to get there it's not and he's like 
No, I got to stay right. with Coach Billy. Coach Billy's my dude. You know, I understand. Mom. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so we, I took him and, you know, dragged him out of the car and got him on the court. And he went through the day of evals and, you know, was hitting with different kids and different coaches. And when the evaluation was over, he came over to the car and I said, so do you want to come back tomorrow? And he's like, oh my God, this was so awesome. Yes, I want to train here. I want to be here every single day. So this is my son in a nutshell, okay? <laughs> he does not handle change well. Like I said, he's now 23. Um, he's getting better, but you know, this was kind of a challenge for us. And so he stayed at that academy for um, seven years till he was in the 16s. Uh, maybe six years. And um, during that period of time, we tried homeschooling for a little bit so that he could train a little more intensely, uh, play bigger tournaments that required him to, you know, miss days of school. And finally, um, right before his sophomore year of high school, there was an incident at the academy with another parent, actually, not between me and the parent, but between the parent and my son. And it was a very uncomfortable situation. My son was, did not feel safe in the environment any longer. And so we had to quickly make a change at that point. And for that change, my son was 100% on board because he knew he couldn't go back to where he had been training. So it was, okay. it was necessary to make the change. So there are a lot of reasons, you know, my kids change or my youngest actually changed coaches from me to a very large popular program that was in our community, um, who was run and still is run by a coach who was a friend from before. Um, actually, I knew him from a movie that Ty was in 50,000 balls from way back in the 12s. And so I knew of the program that my daughter went to because of an experience that I had had much earlier. Um, but kids have come to me for all sorts of reasons over the years. And sometimes it was because I was involved in the hot program at that point in time. I was coaching someone who had made a great big jump or who had been high and for a while but now they were old enough yeah. that the younger kids were starting to follow the older ones that were doing well and um and then i had to, some people that really came for really bad reasons I, I had a parent who came to me essentially because uh the parent didn't feel like the child was listening to them and they wanted to be the coach. And so the parent brought the child to me. And at one point shortly after the change specifically said um, the child wouldn't listen to what it was the parent was saying. And so would I say it to the child? Um, so they weren't looking for me. As My a gosh. Coach. They were looking for me as a, a surrogate mouthpiece. A um, conduit. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and, and I think, you know, that brings up a great point, Dewey, that, you know, what are some of the good reasons to change coaches and what are some of the not so good reasons to change coaches and, and what's the potential benefit for the change and maybe potential, you know, fallout from making the change. And, and I think there are all sorts of reasons. I mean, we hear about the coaching carousel all the time and we hear about, kids who go coach to coach to coach they just jump you know depending on where the top kid in the section is is training we that week lisa we don't have a specific question but i know that um somebody by the name of roger white is watching um and chris mm -hmm. cagle um so we have a couple of people that are that are Great. chiming in or that are here and watching what we're doing um and i know i don't know roger well, I know that Chris um, was at Raleigh Racquet Club when I was back in North Carolina leading cool. program there, which is a very strong program. Um, and so, you know, if, Chris, if you have anything, or Roger, if you know, if you have anything you'd like to add to this discussion, please add it in the comments and we are, we'll be sure to kind of comment on it and you can help us along a little bit. Um, Absolutely. 
But I, I want to get back to this whole point of, you know, what are the good reasons to make that change, <clears throat> excuse me, and what are the not so good reasons? And, and how do you know as a parent when it's time or necessary to move on to a different coach? And I think there are some very specific, um, obvious reasons to make a change, but then there may be some less subtle or, you know, more subtle ones as well. So, I mean, I think in our situation um, where, you know, we needed to make a change in order to have a coach who understood the process and could get my son to the next level, that made a lot of sense. And, you know, when my son was in a situation where he didn't feel safe, obviously that made a lot of sense to make that change as well. Um, we had one more coaching change that happened uh, a couple years, well, it was, I think, the end of my son's junior year, if I'm not mistaken. So it was a pretty quick subsequent change. And that happened because the academy my son was training in changed hands. The main coach who had been there for generations left and took all, well, most of the top kids with him. My son decided not to leave at that time because he was working with one of the other coaches who stayed and he loved that coach, but every boy his same age and level wound up leaving the academy. And so my son was left there with a bunch of 10 and under players so was and nothing, it was just nothing left. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's it was just really not a great one. situation. When there's a player who is out of level and there's not a peer group there. Um, and we got a couple of more people watching. My, my sister Stephanie is tuned in. Um, but also, Hi, and here's, here's going to be a little plug. Um, a good friend of mine, a guy by the name of Chris Suter from Scotland, um, is watching. And Chris is kind of Judy Murray. I know right Chris. Hand, right, right hand man. And Judy is yeah. doing a clinic, a mishits clinic in Dallas, Texas at noontime. Unfortunately, I'm down here in Austin, so I'm not going to get to go to Judy's clinic. Um, but Chris has a lot of experience in players having yeah. moved. Um, the, when he and Judy had this player development system in Scotland, you know, you were trying to get in. You weren't trying to get out. If you were out, yeah. it's because you got kicked out, <laughs> not because you we're trying to leave. Um, so, um, so we have some good knowledge here. So hopefully, uh, we can raise our game and, you know, talk about talk about the reasons why someone really does need to change. And I think the one of somebody being out of level is mm -hmm. really a key one, where there's just you're not getting what you need, um, and you're not maybe not even getting the social aspect of it um, because Eight for whatever years. reason, you know, yeah, I mean, it, you want to do stuff with your friends and, and with your peers. Right. And if you're not having, and you don't have any peers, um, then it's You increase really the risk of burnout. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, this is no. a bad habit of mine. I'll, I'll, I'll try and fix it before our next one. But, um, we're just getting started. This is week one. We're going to, we're going to work through the yeah. details of how this whole thing works and figure it out. Um, you know. Yeah. But, but I was going to say, the, especially yeah. for teenagers, burnout is such a huge factor. And we know how many kids drop out of tennis, you know, by the age of 13. And if they don't have peers to train with, or at least hang out with at side changes and all of that, the, you just increase the chances that they're going to just say, forget it. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to find something else where I can be with my friends. And I think that's important, but I think it's also important to look at, you know, don't be what I would refer to as a, an academy whore, where you've been to every program in your community. In a place <laughs> like Atlanta, you know, you could probably change programs every six months from 12 and unders on and still not run out of programs to try. Uh, absolutely. Because yeah. there are that many. And it takes yeah. a certain amount of time. You know, the danger of changing programs is, at least in the United States, coaches have a philosophy that they like to adhere to, that they want players to play a certain way or 
mechanics to be a certain mechanic. And so every time you start over with a new coach, you're also starting back from almost ground zero in mm -hmm. some cases in terms of what you're doing um, because we don't have a national system where you understand what a player's game is built upon and so therefore you can use the same situations and the same drills and build on the player's game. It is really a regression back to a place where the coach feels like, okay, it's now mine. Um, and at the same time, I think it's also important to know that there's a feeling out period and it's real easy to blow up the relationship early on because we don't fully understand what the other person is saying and I think that that first year um, is critical that you work through the situations in that first year rather than just saying oh this one isn't going to work because I, I know I've had a lot of players that came and three months later they left and then I kind of knew where they went because they went someplace local and then I find out six months later they're no longer at that next place that they went to and they moved on and mm -hmm. then eventually the kid isn't playing tennis um, and I suspect that's often driven by the parent and I think when your son was very young it had to be driven by you right you your son Absolutely. had no idea how to be much better at anything than he probably was at tennis at that point in time. So you had to drive right. the bus a little bit. But then at 16, it was much more important that he be, you know, lead the decision making to a degree. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, finances aside, because for a lot of families, the, the decision to change a coach might be financially driven. Um, and so you know, in those situations, we're talking about something very different, but if finances are not the issue, if it is either a personality conflict or a lack of people at their level in their current situation or something else that comes up, um, I think as the player becomes a teenager and, and becomes Mm, a little more in control of their tennis as they should, as they get older, you know, they need to own it. And once they are in that position to own it, then I think it's really important that the player give thought and, and give feedback to the parent about what's working and what's not working. Because we know this is a big financial investment. You know, junior tennis is not cheap, but we want to make sure that our kids are in coaching situations where not only are they improving their tennis game, but also they're improving their life skills and are becoming much more um, uh, able to make good decisions. Um, they're developing their character in a way that feels right for the family. And all of those things need to come into play and if the player comes to you at age 15, at age 16, and says, you know what, this coaching situation isn't working for me because A, B, C, then I think it's really important that the parents, you know, engage in a conversation around that with their player and make a decision together about what's best. I think it's also important to include the coach, because it might be a miscommunication before just making that change because I think sure. oftentimes it comes out of the blue sure. and the coach had no idea that it was coming. Um, if I can read well, you, and I think... Chris, oh, Chris made a comment and maybe this can fit into what we're talking. He said, I mentioned to 60 parents the other night that children need decompression time and most of the time that comes from their social scene in their school. I believe we miss a trick when we don't introduce a social side to the tennis environment this comes from having a great team, peer, friend feeling within the tennis program. Um, I agree 100%. You know, there needs to be a social piece and opportunities for these kids to just be kids, not kids who are tennis players. I agree 100%. And you know, we, we travel as yeah. a team a lot. The kids do things outside of the program, often movie nights and other social 
events. Um, it just so happens that we're in an environment where we also have a school. So we have 35 kids in accredited school, so they're with each other from 7 in the morning until 7 in the evening, um, five days a week, and then they're often traveling to tournaments and things together. Uh, and mm -hmm. it has to be about more than tennis, otherwise we lose them. And sometimes the coach is just regimented. So we have to leave because it is just tennis, 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 tennis. And you know, we, we don't put our kids in anything to be in a regimented environment generally, at least not starting. So why does it change just because the player gets better? Um, we've got to be with somebody that we know cares about the kid first and the tennis second. And oftentimes when it becomes all about the tennis and the kid isn't valued, then maybe it's time to make a change and find somebody that's more people-centered than, than they are sport centered and i know we're going to catch some flack for this do we because there are going to be people out there that watch this and say but if you want your kid to get a d1 scholarship or be you know top 100 in the world it's got to be tennis 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 you know you got to reinforce that and and i i will acknowledge that there are prodigies out there who, you know, it's clear from the get-go that they have the skill, they have the mindset, they have the work ethic, the parents have the financial means or the means to get the finances to support it. And that is a, an infinitesimal percentage of the tennis playing population. I mean, it's, you know, itty bitty, itty bitty. So for the rest of the kids out there who really are aspiring to get as good as they can get, which may mean playing for their high school team, it may mean playing league, it may mean playing in college at one of the divisions, but not necessarily a top D1 school, whatever it means, the important piece is that we keep them playing tennis and that we help them to develop into great human beings and that's to me that's the ultimate goal and to find a coach and a program that also has that goal you know if you find that grab onto it and as long as it continues to work for your child and your family stay there stick it out and if there are little minor bumps along the way which there will be you know, figure out a way over or around the bumps. Those are important life skills that your child is going to acquire too. So it's figuring out what matches up between where you are and what your needs are and your goals are and what's able to be brought to the table by that coach, right? Maybe the coach is very good at teaching technique, um, but your kid is more now hitting tennis balls than playing the game of tennis. So you need to have a coach mm -hmm. that's more tactically centered. Um, so they kind of teach the technique from a tactical perspective. Or, you know, a coach has no idea of footwork, speed, strength type of things. Um, and you need to add that component. Or I certainly believe um, some coaches are much better at the psychological side than others and that you know, largely streams from their own level of emotional intelligence and how much they, you know, actually see other people versus they're centered on themselves. Um, so right. that skill set of the coach is no longer matching up to what you believe is the whole. Um, should you change coaches or should you add another coach? Well, I think it depends, you know, it depends on where you live, first of all. Um, not everybody lives in a place where they have access to a fitness specific coach, a footwork coach, a mental coach. Um, and so maybe there is a coach in the area that has that expertise that can supplement, or maybe there is just the need to, as we discussed um, in our last conversation, uh, just bringing in, you know, through video or through some other means, um, another voice. But if, you know, if the goal, if the, and, and you say your goals, your goals, I, from where I'm sitting, that to me is the player's goals. And the player's goals have to be filtered through what the family can do, both financially and time-wise, right? 
Um, you know, it's all well and good for a kid to say, I want to be number one in the world and I want to be trained so that I can be number one in the world. But if the parents on our, aren't on board with that, it's rare for that to actually happen. So I think, you know, communication is huge, but I also feel like, um, you know, changing coaches just for the sake of changing coaches usually doesn't work in the player's favor. Changing Absolutely. coaches when there is a specific reason, you know, yes. So changing coaches because your kid lost a tournament is an absolute piss poor bad idea. Everybody has good tournaments yes. and has bad tournaments. And we all are this up and down cycle. And so every time we reach a peak, we're on our way into a valley. And that's going to mean that we're not playing as well. You know, there's a limited number of days per year where you're going to play your absolute best tennis. And there's also a limited number of days where you're going to play your absolute worst tennis. And if that worst tennis... Yeah, yesterday was one of those for me, just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It got cold and my hands weren't working very well. So at least I blame it on that rather than general lack of skills. Um, so, it, but you know, if you catch competition on one of those five days a year where you're not going to beat anybody that you're generally competitive with, and it falls in on one of those days that's the major tournament, um, and sometimes it, it's not a reason to change. And sometimes you can't help it. You see all the time, you know, the U.S. Open series in the summer. And you see that player that gets really hot. And it's, they win two tournaments before the U.S. Open. And then they get to the semis of the one right before the U.S. Open. And then they lose second round of the Open. Well, you know, right. maybe right. They, they weren't planning on playing as much because they hadn't been getting to finals before. And so they reached right. that peak faster than what they had wanted to. And maybe it was the first time they had ever done that well. And the coach was not expecting and couldn't manage that. And maybe for the coach, it was the first time. Because, you know, I know yeah. that I never coached anybody who won a gold ball before I coached somebody who won a gold ball, right? So if you right. were to look at my track record before that, you would say, why would I put my kid with this guy? Because he's never taken anybody to that level. And, but right. somebody stuck with me. And I did um, on, yeah. on several occasions. So was I a better coach afterwards? Yeah, maybe I was because I had had the experience of helping somebody right. through that final weekend. But was it a precursor to say that now I'm a, a great coach? No, I mean, I, I would say as a parent, I'm looking for somebody who wants to make a name for themselves with my kid. Right. I, I don't care if you live on that name that you made by helping my kid be great for the next 20 years. All I care about is during this period of time, you are trying to help my kid be the absolute best that they yeah. can be. Um, and, but I think parents are real quick to make changes based on one result, you know, and they say they're looking right. for high performance, but what they're looking for is immediate upgraded performance. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we know that's not possible. I mean, tennis is is a marathon, not a sprint. We say it all the time. It you know takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to achieve whatever your potential is in this sport. And so you can't be results oriented. You can't make decisions solely based on results. However, I will say that you know, there, there is a point in time that if you notice that your child is not keeping up with the competitors that he or she was once competitive against, meaning the, the peers in your age group are all of a sudden making these tremendous gains and your child seems to be falling further and further behind, it is time to ask so a few questions, you know, is it the level of coaching? Is it my child's level of commitment? Is it the work effort? You know, what's going on that's causing this change? And then make the decision. You know, I would say for those watching who have children in younger age groups, watch out for the trap of having your child have a lot of early success because what happens is you will then if you change coaches and your kid is already at the very top the coach is much less likely to continue to help your child's game evolve 
because they don't want the child to potentially get worse and then the parent to say, oh no, my kid's getting worse and then the parent changes coaches when in reality what then happens is there are these other kids that were maybe a little bit further back in the pack and they are constantly making changes trying to catch up and they catch up and then they go a little bit ahead and you have the player that was always ahead and the player and the parent thinks of it as wow that's just a bad loss it was an off day it was and when reality what it was is these other kids are constantly making changes and understanding change and it takes until they've gone pretty far past and now you realize oh I have to make changes but now you're playing catch up to people who are already used to making changes and so they're continuing to evolve and you're playing catch up as opposed to early they were hitting a stationary stagnant target because you weren't working on getting any better because you didn't want to change your coaches didn't want to make a change for fear that you were going to move programs and so you're sitting here and they're continuing to go and they go by but they're going to keep moving and you're moving and you may never catch up again so watch out for that uh, my kids the number one 12 and under in whatever in my academy in my state in the country um or in the right. world it's tough to maintain that well and i think that's what's so impressive about sophia kennan you know and who just won the australian open and the fact that she was the number one player in every age group throughout the juniors that is a rare feat and a rare accomplishment and so i I worry that people are going to now say, well, if my kid's not number one in the 12s and the 14s and, you know, that they have no chance. That's a rare thing. There are not many players that achieve that throughout their junior career. And it happened for her to lead to a top professional player. But just because your kid isn't number one in all the age groups doesn't necessarily mean they can't develop to that level as they get older. So I, I just, you know, there's so many things that happen in the sport and being an individual sport, everybody's story is different. Everybody's path is different. And that's what makes yeah. it so tricky, but also so beautiful. So here's my bottom line is you start where things are very close and local, right? We put our kids in things which are close to us till we find out that they like them. And then there is often a necessity to change and to travel a little bit further, whatever that is. In Atlanta, it might not be very much further. In some mm -hmm. other cities, you might have to, you know, go a couple of towns away in order to find the level of coaching that you want. And if once you make that move, if you're making more than one more move throughout your child's junior tennis career, it needs to be because something major occurred um, that was unexpected, unforeseen, could not have been foreshadowed in any way and caught you out of the blue, like whatever happened with the other parent and your son. And that made right. that situation untenable. And so now there was a need for another change. But absent of an occurrence like that, three, maybe four coaches throughout your child's entire junior tennis career is probably plenty for most. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And that's our tennis takeaway for this week, right, Dewey? That's it. This is going to be another one come next week. Um, I think we're still talking about what it's going to be, um, but it will certainly be another episode of Tennis Takeaways with Lisa and Dewey seen on the Parenting Aces YouTube channel on my Tennis 2020 YouTube channel. Um, today I actually streamed it also to my personal Facebook page and I think maybe next week Parenting Aces Facebook page or your page cool. or something related to you just so that the Facebook people get a chance to see it and it's always available during video on demand on either of our YouTube channels. Um, Absolutely. I think it would be great. Well thanks Dewey. Yeah. Loved Let's it. Let's do it again next week. See you then. Bye. Yeah, so we're still, I think we're still on my Facebook page. Um, okay, but we're off.